Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alicia Poon, and I am the director of the Indian Arts Research Center here at the School for Advanced Research. I will be introducing this year's speaker series to you and then beginning today's discussion. But first, I'd like to begin this program by saying that the School for Advanced Research is located on Tewa lands in Ogapoque, Owinge, or Santa Fe, New Mexico. Surrounding our campus are the landscapes of Pueblo, Apache, and Navajo communities whose people continue to maintain vital connections to this place. As an institution privileged to stewarding indigenous cultural material and committed to uplifting indigenous voices, we strive to maintain respectful and mutually beneficial relationships with these communities. We not only honor the ancestral stewards of this land, but celebrate their past, present, and future. I'd like to clarify that I recite this acknowledgement not out of rote nor out of obligation, but because I want to remind us all about where we are and to reaffirm that the discussions we have today and through this series and the work we do as the Indian Arts Research Center as a whole is centered around and accountable to the indigenous communities that surround us. So this is our 100th anniversary of the Indian Arts Research Center collection. Happy birthday to us. How did we get here and what does that mean? In the wake of Manifest Destiny and a global pandemic, a group of Santa Fe creatives came together in 1922 to found the Pueblo Pottery Fund, enmeshed in assimilationist policies and salvage ethnography, their misguided attempt to save what they saw as the loss of Pueblo culture was born of false assumptions and misinformation. Nonetheless, their efforts to set the stage for what would eventually become the Indian Arts Research Center collection. 100 years and yet another global pandemic later, 2022 marks the centennial of the IRC collection. Numbering over 12,000 items of native Southwest art and history, the collection is central to the IRC's mission to bridge the divide between indigenous centric creativity and scholarship. In the years since the IRC's, IRC collections founding, much has changed in the ways museums work with collections and partner with the communities from which these collections come. Today, many realize the need to adapt their practices to better serve and reflect source communities, as well as those that surround the museum. However, there is still so much more work that needs to be done. The series seeks to explore the roles of collections then and now, and the responsibility and accountability of collecting institutions to the communities they serve. As we begin this journey, today's discussion brings myself together with former IRC directors, Cynthia Chavez Lamar and Brian Bio for a deep dive into the past, present and future of the Indian Arts Research Center. At this point, I would like them to uh, invite, I would like to invite them to turn on their cameras. And in just a minute, I am going to invite them to introduce themselves to you in their own way. But first, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank both of them for being my mentors over the last 15 years or so. I was fairly early in my career when I started working under Cynthia at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque, and then continued working for her here at the Indian Arts Research Center. And then it was my privilege to then serve under Brian at the IRC for several years before following in both of their very impressively large shadows in 2019. I could not be in this possession that I am now without acknowledging two of the primary people who literally raised me to be the museum professional I am today. And I want to say thank you for that. Cynthia, with that, let's start with you. Um, could you introduce yourself and then maybe tell us a little bit about your time at SAR? 
Sure. Well, thank you, Alicia, for that um, nice introduction. And I would say from the big, when I first knew you and was introduced to you, I was terribly impressed with you. And um, that's why um, you ended up at the Indian Public Cultural Center with me. And then when I went to IARC, you ended up there with me as well. <laughs> so it's great to see you in this, in this leadership role. I'm uh, Cynthia Chavez Lamar. I'm from San Felipe Pueblo, and I am also Hopi, Tewa, and Navajo on my mother's side of the family. Uh, she's from Palaca, Arizona. I'm currently the somewhat still new director of the National Museum of the American Indian. I'm, of course, just, just starting to settle into that new role, and I'm terribly excited about it and a little bit overwhelmed, but uh, it, it's, it's good. Um, I think all paths have somehow led me here. Um, I can't say that it was a conscient, uh, conscious um, decision or path that I took, but here I am and I'm glad to be here. And I, I do acknowledge, uh, you know, previous institutions that I worked at, like the, the School for Advanced Research in the Indian Public Cultural Center for, you know, helping nurture me as a museum professional. In particular, you know, SAR holds a very special place in my heart. Um, I think, if um, I hadn't been drawn back to NMAI in 2014, I could have probably stayed at SAR until I retired um, because that's how happy I was working there. You know, it's a very unique institution. Um, I see it as a place where, you know, collections, communities, artists, and scholars intersect. And it's just a really ripe environment for cross um, communication and collaboration. And that's what I really enjoyed about it. It just, I think we had uh, a lot of freedom to really um, create programs and projects that were community and artist centered and, um, and, and you know, had the support of, of leadership. And, I'm, and, I, and I see that today, that that thread has continued today. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that and also happy to be here to have this conversation with, with Brian and Alicia. Thank you, Cynthia. How about you, Brian? Could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your time here at SAR? Thank you, Alicia. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for this opportunity to join you uh, for the uh, this initial discussion and presentation and happy birthday, Indian Arts Research Center. Um, it's really exciting, a hundred years, wow. Uh, and there's so much in that hundred year history that um, we were all a part of and contributed to and are contributing to um, along with our communities from where we come. But um, I'm Brian Vio and I'm from Acoma Pueblo. I served as the uh, director of Indian Arts Research Center for a, a very short term. Um, I think I was just getting settled in um, with the work and getting to know the history and the collections and um, certainly um, becoming more aware of the scholarship and um, all the great programming that uh, comprises SAR uh, outside of the Indian Arts Research Center, but also, you know, kind of Establishing, my, establishing myself in Santa Fe, uh, becoming part of the community. Uh, I, I feel like Santa Fe really embraced me and it felt like being in Acoma sometimes because of people were so friendly. And um, I, I just felt like it was a community that um, was similar to, to that of, uh, uh, of Acoma and Pueblo, Pueblo life. Um, but uh, I think that, um, you know, I had the privilege of coming in after uh, Cynthia and uh, really picking up from, you know, what she left for us, uh, which was a, uh, you know, just really innovative uh, and, and thoughtful programming, community-based programming. And I was very excited to continue that work because it was important and it was really um, setting a new bar for the ways in which an institution like 
SAR and museums in general uh, could work with communities. But it was really important, I think, to, to SAR because, you know, SAR, as we all know, has this kind of reputation in Santa Fe, right? That it's this kind of elitist, um, you know, behind that turquoise gate institution that, um, you know, some people would say they don't know what happens beyond that gate and, um, and that it's not accessible. But the programming that was established and um, some of the new program that we developed uh, certainly helped to um, tear down that barrier and really uh, invite not only the Santa Fe community, but more importantly, the descendant communities, uh, those who are connected to this collection uh, into or onto the campus and into the, the vaults of the IARC. And I, you know, had a great staff, and I'm so proud of you, Alicia, that you are in this position and continuing this important work, and um, others who have joined the staff, um, the numerous uh, interns and artists who come through those doors, all very impressive, and all who leave their mark in a big way. So um, thank you again for, for this opportunity. Thank you, Cynthia, also for your mentorship. And... Um, uh, your leadership and your current role at NMAI. Um, so yeah, look forward to today's conversation. Thank you, Brian. So um, I guess I'll just start off. Um, and so the roles of collecting institutions, they continue to evolve in response to the needs of the communities that they serve. And museums are increasingly looking back on past practices through a critical lens, um, including SAR itself, in order to move forward with a more considered approach to cultural stewardship. Um, IRC has been actively thinking about these issues um, these last couple of decades. And as such, you know, we've developed several key programs that now define what we do. Um, I'd like for us to talk a bit about the guidelines for collaboration, I feel like that kind of centers a lot of what we do today. And Cynthia, you were the one um, to um, really bring that project on to SAR. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and maybe describe it briefly and why they were developed and maybe even what the field looked like before? Sure, um, well, I was, I was um scrolling through the, part, the attendee list and uh, I saw Landis Smith's name and Landis uh, is really one of the key individuals um, that played um, you know, uh, the major role and, and in, in, in starting or bringing the idea of the guidelines forward. Um, the other person I'd like to acknowledge in that effort is Jim Enote um, who at the time when, I, when he was involved, he was the director of the Ashiwi Awan uh, Heritage Center at Zuni. But really this, you know, I feel like um, when, you're, when you're a museum professional, some of the greatest ideas come from just talking with colleagues and being open to, um, you know, one, have networking and two, to um, helping facilitate um, great ideas that are presented to you. And that's really what happened uh, with the guidelines is, um, you know, Landis uh, being a, a, major, a major player in the field of conservation for so many years and working with um, communities over the course of her career, you realize that there was such a need for guidelines for, you know, um, emerging conservators as well as those who work with collections on how to collaborate. You know, I think at the time, you know, this was, I'm trying to think of this like the mid 2000s um, and, um, or yeah, mid to early 2000s. And, um, you know, there was collaboration happening, uh, but I think that um, there was still this hesitancy in terms of, am I, am I collaborating or, am, or am I consulting? And, um, you know, Landis had recognized um, within her own field that there was that hesitancy and that to have some sort of guidelines might be helpful in encouraging more um, conservators and museum professionals to collaborate. So that was sort of one conversation that was going on at the same time um, at um, IARC, um, 
I had um, the staff and I had been engaging in collections reviews with Zuni um, and Jim Eno was a large part of that, that initiative. He was really the person that brought that idea of collections uh, reviews forward. And in the course of that work, he you know, um, continually brought up the fact that you know, as indigenous people going to museums and viewing collections across the US and even internationally, um, you know, a lot of people, indigenous people didn't ever know what to expect. And wouldn't it be helpful if indigenous people had you know, some sort of some guidance or some you know, a document that helped them understand what, what to expect, what questions to ask. So it was really those two individuals that I feel like from the beginning sort of shaped the direction of the guidelines. And, um, and you know, I think that um, you know, they, they really deserve the credit for coming up with great ideas. And you know, those of us, Brian, Alicia, uh, and I were really um, just helped facilitate to move those forward. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and you kind of kind of briefly mentioned uh, the collection reviews and things like that. And one of the things that happened while um, Brian, you were with us is that we began a collection review of Acoma Pueblo. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe the community impact of you know, the collections reviews and the guidelines for collaboration from your perspective. Sure, thank you, Alicia. <clears throat> uh, I see myself, um, or I saw myself as the middleman <laughs> with the um, guidelines because, again, a lot of the work and, and those foundational pieces were established during uh, Cynthia's term as the director. And then, of course, uh, after my departure, Alicia took over and led the um, completion of the uh, and the publication of, of the guidelines. Um, <clears throat> but I you know, I, I will say that the the guidelines uh, and during my tenure was, um, you know, we were at a point where the uh, those foundational pieces were really um, providing the um, well, they were the basis for then expanding the involvement uh, because this became more of a community based initiative, really. Um, where we reached out to many Native American um, artists, scholars, uh, museum uh, professionals, community leaders, and others who uh, really helped us to reach the point where the guidelines, um, you know, were um, really from that voice of the community. Uh, and, and a lot of the recommendations that were brought forward uh, came not only from the core uh, group who were, who had been working on these for several years, but they were um, uh, certainly supported by the community uh, members or tribal members who participated um, and, and really helped us to refine the language uh, and placement of these recommendations within the guidelines so that they, you know, made sense to the community, to the tribal leadership within the communities, to the artists and and uh, others from the community who have the desire to um, gain access to collections and museums, to make contact with um, uh, uh, individual representatives of museums um, and beyond the museums. I think it also uh, really helped in um, the rethinking of our involvement in consultation. So uh, certainly um, in, uh, very much of an, uh, an impact on, on our communities. And, and so, yeah, the collections reviews, you know, again, as Cynthia indicated, Zuni was kind of one of those um, uh, Pueblos that um, engaged in a very intense um, uh, review of the Zuni collection. And uh, there were a lot of lessons learned from that experience. Um, one, it led to, of course, a, you know, thinking about uh, some sort of guidelines, but it also, I think, uh, really set the course for 
the ways in which an institution like SAR and IARC um, can work with the communities, with descendant communities, to understand the collections, to understand what we are uh, taking care of, um, and the, the best ways to provide access, um, to understand the cultural sensitivities around the, the collections, uh, but to also get to know the people themselves. And <clears throat> during the Akama collections reviews, you know, I, I coming in as a director, I I didn't think that Akama would you know be um, actually next on the list to to go through that process. But I was really thankful that um, Akama was open to the idea, um, and it really helped me uh, to understand the process. Uh, it it helped me to understand the role of uh, the institution and the staff uh, of IARC in this process. Um, but also, you know, then um, getting, and this was a, just really a personal <laughs> benefit for me and privilege really, was to be able to review that ACMA collection um, primarily in our own language. And, um, you know, I, 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 I do regret that perhaps we didn't provide enough interpretation during that process for staff. Um, but I, I think that as we went on in that process, the ACMA representatives also learned how to read or interpret what they had, may have conveyed in our own language. Um, and it was uh, really a beautiful uh, uh, exercise. And, um, you know, what a time commitment on the part of the tribe and the representatives. But, um, you know, in the end, a great benefit, uh, mutual, mutually rewarding experience for both SAR and, and the Pueblo. And I uh, hope that these re reviews continue uh, because it just really enhances in a very profound way the documentation, the understanding, and um, which allows then for the institution to expand its programming uh, in, in those ways that are meaningful to the communities uh, from where they come from. Thank you for addressing that, Brian. And yeah, I mean, it's been wonderful seeing, you know, the impact of the guidelines and also the way it's kind of helped us kind of clarify our process at the Indian Arts Research Center. Um, one of the ways that we realized that, oh, maybe some of the things weren't, some things that weren't addressed in the guidelines had to do with, um, you know, other areas of museums, such as, you know, facilities and risk management and human resources and um, organizational structure. And um, I'm happy to say that, you know, out of the guidelines, um, SAR in, in partnership with the United Arts started to work on um, what we're calling the core standards for museums with Native American collections, which will kind of expand. Um, on the guidelines and kind of address different ways that institutions and communities and um, Native American professionals can work together um, in a more equitable and easy manner. Um, and we hope to be able to debut those uh, next year. Um, fingers crossed, <laughs> the pandemic kind of um, slows things down a little bit, but that is our plan. And we look forward to sharing you. And we're so thankful that we had this process um, initiated so that we could kind of get to this point where we're looking at broader aspects um, of the museum field as well. Alicia, mm -hmm. can I just add one more um, comment? And, and this would be concerning you know, the capacity um, at the tribal level. I think that the collections review process has really um, provided the on hands experience, on -hands experience um, for the Pueblo representatives, uh, many of whom are engaged in similar projects with other institutions now. And I often get asked or I get a phone call on occasion by one of the ACMA uh, representatives who participated in the collections reviews and um, you know, uh, ask about a particular project maybe that they've been asked to participate. And just recently, um, 
uh, one of the participants uh, actually traveled with me to Denver on a uh, for a similar uh, review of Acoma, uh, historic Acoma textiles. And she was a pro. <laughs> Boy, she led that review like it was her project. And I was so proud of her. And she's an elder of the community. But to see her in action on her own, asking the right questions, um, challenging the museum on their uh, recommendations around conservation, it was just really incredible to, to witness. Uh, so, you know, it really uh, has uh, empowered these artists and, and uh, cultural leaders from our communities, uh, at least here at Acoma, I've seen it firsthand. And, um, and those conversations that they have amongst themselves or had among themselves at and during the collections reviews at IARC continue to happen at home. And it's really been uh, great to see that here at Acoma also is that the potters are having these conversations themselves led by people like, you know, award-winning potters like Robert Patricio, who um, is now a uh, Keras language instructor, instructor and really use, utilizing his experience uh, that he had at SAR uh, in, in his um, instruction here of the, of the Akama Keras dialect. So it's, it's just really been uh, wonderful to see. And as we you know, witness that Zuni and other Pueblos who we were engaged, um, you know, they, are, they are those same people who are involved in consultations. They are the resources that tribal leaders at their Pueblos um, uh, look to, to assist them in um, developing their strategies for consultation and um, review of collections uh, in, housed in various institutions. So thank you for allowing me the extra time. Yeah, no problem. This is a conversation. Um, I guess um, I'd like to turn uh, at this point maybe uh, to focus a little bit on one of our other key programs. And again, um, just a reminder, uh, go ahead and enter your questions in the Q&A. And at the end, we'll um, start addressing all of the questions at the end. Um, but um, I'd like to turn our attention to the internship program at SAR, and I'll just kind of briefly describe it a little bit, and then we can talk about it. Um, so the internship program at SAR is uh, a full-time internship program. We support two artists, nine months out of the year, um, not two artists, two early, early career or uh, student museum professionals, nine months out of the year. It's a fully supported internship that provides both housing and pay. Um, it provides professional development, travel, uh, and it also provides um, additional work with other institutions if that is what the intern desires so that we can better focus on the intern's goals. Um, so why don't we talk about that? So um, either Cynthia or Brian, what do you think has been the impact of the internships for museum professionals? Well, I, I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, of course, I can't say enough good things about SAR and the Indian Arts Research Center because I think it's such a great environment for creating uh, experience or for cultivating uh, really great learning and professional development experiences, um, especially for the interns. You know, when I got there, um, we had the what we were calling the Braniger Fellowship. Tony, you know, Chavaria. Um, your husband was one of <laughs> one of those those early Braniger fellows, and um, he was the first one actually. Oh, okay, well there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember his portrait portrait in the in the IRC. Um, it, you know, I, when I was there, and then we started talking about you know bringing back the the internship program, but maybe in a different way. And we had um, support from the Anne Ray Charitable Trust, and so thinking about how can we better support uh, interns um, an intern experience um, so that they don't have to worry about things like you know their housing and um, having a small stipend on which to live on and and so forth so um, 
you know, of course, SAR is a perfect environment for something like that because you know, we've had this, I say talking like I'm still there. <laughs> you have the scholar in residence program and the artist fellowship program, which also, you know, provides housing. So, um, you know, it was just seemed really natural to, to be able to integrate um, the interns into that kind of experience. And I would say now, you know, currently there are quite a few programs, you know, specifically targeted to um, early career um, indigenous um, um, students and others who are interested in the, in the museum field. Um, I, what I'm most interested in now is how do we get these people jobs? Um, you know, there's, I, I know there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the fact that when people get into um, great museum positions, they tend to stay in them for a long period of time. So there's not like a preponderance of, you know, position openings. Um, however, there are at times and how can we really get, um, you know, awareness about these position, position openings um, to, these, to these individuals that have you know, these fellowship experiences and these internship experiences. Um, um, how can we get them to apply? How can we, you know, get them into our, our various institutions? Um, as an example, uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, NMAI, like other institutions, experienced people retiring, um, people leaving their positions, you know, for different reasons, you know, sort of an eye-opening experience, right? And you tend to sort of focus less on your job and, and your personal connections and relationships. So, you know, we have seen um, at least 11% um, of our staff um, leave for various reasons. Um, so we have positions that are going to be open or that are open, that are being posted on USA Jobs. And, um, you know, as the new director, I have to look carefully at how can we build awareness about these position openings. In addition, how can we help um, people through the hiring process? Because applying for a federal or any kind of, you know, government job is not, is not an easy, is not easy. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what I'm focused on now. I think that the internship programs and fellowship programs we have in place, we have a, we have a, we have a good number of them, not to say that we shouldn't have any more, um, but I feel like a lot of effort was put into developing those programs. They exist. So now the next step is how do we get jobs filled by some of these people that are going through these programs? Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important to be able to also recognize that, you know, these internships and museum positions for Native people exist out of, outside of the curatorial area as well. Mm -hmm. like so many people, they think of museums and they, they just think, oh, okay, my place is in curation, my place is working on the exhibits, but there's such a wealth of um, information and possibilities in terms of um, being working in a museum and being able to be there to help affect change. And of course, that has to happen within as within an institution as a whole, right? It doesn't just happen within the curatorial department. It doesn't just happen within the education department. The entire institution needs to move forward as a whole and, and make those changes to work uh, more equitably with communities and um, being able to fill more uh, put more Native people into positions that are outside of the kind of traditional curatorial roles, I think is so essential and making sure that people are trained for those roles and people know about those positions when they are open. Um, I think that's something that we all need to work on and look, uh, look toward. Well, one of the things I really appreciated about the, um, the um, Anne Ray internship was that it was, it was more well-rounded. I mean, mm -hmm. because IRC is not an exhibiting institution per se. The emphasis on curatorial wasn't as strong, which, you know, from my perspective, is kind of a good thing because then the people that you were getting to come in through the internship program would get a more um, diverse experience in terms of, you know, their introduction to various aspects of the museum field, which, you know, of course, at IRC, more collections focus. 
Um, but I think it, 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 you know, there are so many programs that out there that are, are, are more focused just on the curatorial track. Um, and I hear a lot of that from, from you know, early career um, in museum professionals that they're interested in the curatorial track. And I think the curatorial, the curatorial positions are the ones that are most few and far between. Mm -hmm. Exactly, I completely agree. Um, Brian, any thoughts about maybe what, what are the possibilities for, you know, the future of internships and, you know, how can that serve community? Well, <clears throat> Cynthia shared some really important points about the, the internships and, and the artist fellowships as well. And one of, one of the things that was always exciting for me was to read the, the applications and to hear about their projects and of their interests and, and to know about the, the work that a lot of these uh, applicants are already engaged in, you know, whether it be within their own community or in a Native American community uh, or, you know, in um, a university setting. Uh, you know, it's, there's just some just incredible uh, uh, talent and, and potential. And, and that was always exciting for me. And the, the sad part was that you could only select two, um, you know, from, from the grouping, uh, because you want to bring as many of those, those folks in. Um, but I think one of the, the things that um, really sets SAR's internships uh, apart, the NRA internship especially, is you know, that um, opportunity that the internship, interns have to engage with community, to really understand um, and, and see firsthand um, the, the potential that exists there and the great learning opportunity that is there for them uh, when they are, uh, you know, working with community members, when they are in the community itself. Uh, when they are doing the recruitment for addition, for future interns at feast days uh, and other, you know, community-based events, you know, I, I just felt like that was just such an incredible, incredibly valuable um, experience that these folks were, were having. Um, and, and I think it came through loud and clear in, in you know, the small uh, exhibits they would uh, curate. Um, and the research that then they would engage in, uh, I think really, um, you know, there was that focus around uh, community um, engagement and collaboration. And I thought that that was really a, a great uh, uh, thing that was happening there uh, at, at IARC. Um, the other thing that it's, I, I, you know, I, I'm just really grateful that these interns and artist fellows um, come onto the campus with full support. Just an incredible network of support from not only the IRC staff, but also from the leadership of SAR and the community uh, and partners of, of SAR. Uh, I think that here again, we have such a, uh, I'm, not, I'm talking like Cynthia now, like I'm, I'm part of part of it, uh, but SAR and IRC have this incredible network of people and resources. Um, and seeing all that come together um, for these interns and artists was really powerful to me, that these young people, most of them were young, um, you know, have access to such a great pool of resources that they could go and meet in person with these individuals and these individuals will make time for them um, and, and learn so much in, in you know, that short period of time that they have. Um, some of these resources would provide them with uh, very unique experiences. And um, I think that was just really incredible um, that you know, the, the interns and the artists can also work outside beyond those walls of SAR um, and really, you know, uh, explore the opportunities beyond um, the institution itself. So I, I thought that that was just another valuable um, 
component to to this experience that, and training that is uh, provided to to the interns and the artists. Um, and I think that you know it, it, just general exposure, especially for the artists, um, it, it was always really exciting to see the artists engaged like at, at events like Indian Market and, and all of the you know events that are associated with that weekend um, and seeing the artists, the SAR, IRC artists engaged, fully engaged. And um, I, I just thought that was really great as well um, and that they were getting to be known um, through uh, that type of interaction, but also uh, through the efforts of the Indian Arts Research Center and, and the little marketing and promotion that we were engaged in at the time, uh, that there was also this other component that really helped to um, uh, introduce the artists to perhaps a larger audience beyond what they had established um, at, the, at, at, the, at the time they were at I, IRC. So um, just a lot of really innovative and um, uh, unique benefits that uh, maybe you don't get that, uh, you know, in, 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 in other uh, internship settings. So yeah, a valuable, um, definitely a valuable program. And it would be great that we always talked about expanding it. And, you know, we wishing that we had the facilities to offer more to the artists and offer more to the to the interns. Um, and maybe that will happen in the future. But um, I think that this is an incredible model. Um, and um, one that I think will continue to be of great benefit to our Native American um, and non-Native um, uh, interns. Yeah, I think something that I remember discussing with Cynthia when we were kind of redeveloping um, the original iteration of what is now the Anne Ray internships and realizing how important it was in our own experiences to have um, training in other areas outside of just the one area we were interested in, but also recognizing how difficult it is to enter the museum field, one, when you don't know um, what the path is to go there, but two, um, when you're struggling to try to pay the finances um, or tr trying to figure out where you're gonna head next. Um, I've seen interns around town even, you know, couch surfing for the first three months of the, their internships because they can't find a place to live because Santa Fe has a very high cost of living. And it's something that we felt was really essential to be able to provide housing, to be able to pay our interns and to give them those professional experiences in um, a setting where they didn't have to go out and find um, you know, what little housing was available and what, and didn't have to worry about where their next paycheck was going to come from. And I'm so glad that, you know, there are so many more opportunities now for museum professionals to have these paid opportunities because um, it really helps kind of break down those traditional um, ideas of who gets to work in a museum and, um, you know, to, you know, bring in voices that, you know, haven't always been heard or recognized, you know, within the broader museum context. And I, I'll just say that that um, you know Brian pointed out the fact that you know SAR and just the the network around um, the that is available to the interns um, is really essential to their to their to their positive experience and in particular uh, and you you still have it today Alicia the great staff you know Daniel. Laura, Jen, Jen um, and I know you have new staff now, but I know those those three are still there and um, including yourself. And um, you were all just so very good at providing that support um, and that guidance um, to the interns. And I know you continue to do that today. And that that is really, really essential to have it to to their growth and to their positive experience. Thank you. Yes, I agree. We have an amazing um, amazing staff and, and some of our interns, several of our interns have become staff and moved on to bigger and better things over the years. And it's been so fulfilling to see that. And I hope that, you know, keeps on expanding into the future. Um, maybe it's a good time now to transition into 
um, our artist fellowship program. It's kind of our other residential program at SAR. Um, we support three artist fellowships per year. Um, deadline to apply every year is January 15th, um, where we just give artists the time and space to work for about two or three months. Um, and you know they have the option to utilize the collections, but really we are there to kind of support the future of Native arts. Um, I like to throw out the question of, you know, how have fellowship programs helped advance Native arts? Um, well, I guess that's my question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound like I'm just repeating myself but I can't say enough about just the, the residential experience and you know, having a campus and, and everybody could stay there. <laughs> that's, that's there for you know, an internship or a fellowship experience. So you know, with the, the artists um, um, fellowships, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think they're very unique in that respect of you know, having, you have a place to live, you have a studio in addition to a place to live. <laughs> and you can spend an inter in uninterrupted time on your work. And the only responsibility or obligation you have to your host institution is that you have to do a talk and um, donate a work of your choosing. So, you know, I, I just feel like that's just a real wonderful opportunity for, for any artist um, to have that um, time as well as to have access to the collection, right? Um, I think one of the, the most interesting um, and examples of, of the impact the collection had on an artist um, in, in the time that I was at REFC was with Jeffrey Gibson. You know, he was sort of a, uh, you know, he was very much considered a contemporary, emerging temp contemporary artist um, when he came on as a, as a, as a fellow and and hadn't at the time seemed to have like much exposure to to um, to I guess historical indigenous art and you know once he started looking at the collection he got really um, um, inspired by textiles and by the patterns in textiles and and to this day I can I can still sort of see that that that, that um, inspiration in his work. Um, but he was, he was somebody that I felt like made a really big leap um, by just being, um, being able to connect with the collection in that way. And um, so I think that sometimes we, we, because of the way that the, the, the Native art history or academia sort of set up these binaries, right? Historically, like we have traditional, we have contemporary. Um, that um, a lot of times, you know, the the overlap of those two isn't as readily visible. And I think um, with that experience that I had with and seeing what happened with Jeffrey Gibson, it was really, really apparent um, how he, you know, how he how he was able to look at something that um, is very much based in cultural traditions and be inspired in a way, but not appropriate it or duplicate it, but just be inspired by it and you know, reflect it in his own way in his work. Yeah, I think I observed kind of maybe a similar experience with another artist fellow. Um, Jordan Craig, who was here during the time that Brian was here. And, you know, she was in the collections, constantly visiting the collections and looking at it. And at the time, she was um, really um, just kind of pulling from ideas based on the um, kind of Southwest motifs and ideas and the landscapes that she was learning about while she was in residence here. Um, again, like Jeffrey, she was. Um, really considered more of a broadly contemporary artist. Um, but, you know, by coming to the IRC, um, as she kind of has moved forward in her career over the, you know, upcoming years, she's really kind of taken that opportunity to embrace her own community and culture and incorporate that into her work in a way that's really um, 
incredible to see, you know, that kind of creativity and um, using, you know, her own ideas and contemporary materials to kind of draw on those threads, uh, those ancestral threads, right? Um, so yeah, it's really phenomenal to see. Um, and, but there's also like these closer relationships, right, with, you know, Ulysses Reed, who was actually just here visiting with us, and um, he was a fellow with us in 2007 and really wanted to um, use the paintings that we had that had been done by his uh, grandfather, uh, Andres Galvan, to kind of bring those paintings back to life in the form of pottery and um, seeing artists kind of reconnect with their communities or kind of take inspiration from those ideas is just really incredible and fulfilling, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was gonna mention Jordan mm -hmm. uh, and, and the ways in which she connected with the collection and how she was inspired. Um, it was really interesting to see how that evolved um, for her. And I was just amazed by how much work she produced while she was there. <laughs> I, it was incredible. I wish I could paint that fast, just as fast as she could. But what a talent. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, while not all of the artists, um, you know, fully engage with the collection, um, you do see the, um, the impact. Of, of the collection and the impact of being on the SAR campus um, as they go about their work and as they're creating. Um, and, and as Cynthia mentioned, you know, it's just, it's just a sweet deal. You know, you get housing, you get your own studio, you get the materials and supplies, uh, you have access to the collection, you have access to other resources at SAR, the library and <clears throat> the scholars and, you know, just that, that whole community there. And, um, you know, it, it just, for some artists, I felt like, um, you know, they were just so focused and it really intense kind of concentration while others, um, very free formed, but, um, you know, embracing everything around them and, you know, walking into those vaults and picking up, um, uh, items in the collection and, just taking the time to study. Um, I always enjoyed watching Kathleen Wall. You know, she's she just has this great personality. And uh, but boy, when she when she got to her work, it was just so concentrated and so free flowing, and it just seemed so easy for her. <clears throat> and I remember during a collections review of uh, Acma Potter's um, the Dolores Lewis, the daughter of Lucy Lewis. Uh, she and Kathleen got into this long conversation about clay. And, and so they exchanged clay. Um, and um, at some point I asked Dolores if she ever used the clay. And she, she said she did. And she actually made a few pots from uh, the clay that was shared uh, by Kathleen. <clears throat> but, um, you know, it was that type of kind of, uh, for some anyway, of the artists, they, they, they fully engaged. And... Um, as you said, just like Jordan, you know, she produced some pieces. And even after she left, I believe she went abroad to, I don't remember what country it was, but she had another fellowship abroad. And uh, the pieces that she produced during that internship were also clearly inspired by the collection uh, at the IRC. So it's really great to see that the, the impact of that collection on our contemporary artists. Thank you, Brian. So at this point, um, I'd like to move into kind of a broader, uh, I guess, thought process for us to think about what are our hopes and dreams? What are our thoughts for the state of IRC and really the state of the museum field? What's next? Um, because, you know, although it's been a little bit of a love fest, this far, thus far in this conversation. And I promise I did not set these two up to do that. Um, we're, we're not there, we just aren't. And there's so much work to be done. What are your hopes for the future 
um, what's, what do we need to work on? How can we make ourselves better? Um, so I'll just kind of leave that there for a second and whoever wants to. You can, you can make yourselves better by giving both Brian and I a scholar in residence uh, appointment. <laughs> <laughs> <Done>. <laughs> A year long, of, yeah, that's, that's how long they are anyway, so. <laughs> no, but on, uh, one of the things that was, you know, when I was there, that was a little bit challenging and that that SAR wanted to change was sort of this this division between sort of the, 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 the scholar in residence program, the artist in residence program, the, what we were calling at the time uh, or before I got there, um, the artist convocations, and then you had the scholar to scholar seminars. So, you know, when I was there, we really tried to, to get rid of that divide, you know, so no longer calling the artists gatherings convocations, but they were also seminars in their own right. And um, trying to be better about, um, having more indigenous scholars in the in their in the a scholar program right, to the point where we did create another Anne Ray scholar um, position which I know is no longer there and and I think that you know that having that position I had a very specific intention in mind when I created that and that was really to support the, the interns in terms of their academic development. Um, but of course that, to, to keep that going, it, it needed a lot of nurturing and a lot of attention and a lot of you know, um, 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 intentional recruitment for, for individuals to fill that scholar's position. So I could see how that would have been challenging to, to continue that practice. But I think that's something that SAR is always going to have to grapple with is how do you how do you break down that divide um, where you know so that it's not just it's not you know scholars are in one area one section artists and native arts is in another um, so I think that that's looking forward it's just something that SAR will have to continue to work on. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, and it's something that we, you know, we continue to definitely struggle with um, to get other folks to also understand that Native arts and, you know, museology, that these are scholarly pursuits as well, and that, you know, Indigenous knowledge is scholarly, um, is something we, you know, continue to try to push forward. Um, with the Anne Ray Scholar, yeah, you know, we did, um, uh, decide to shift it a couple of years ago. Um, one, of the, one of the things we realized was that in this particular, at least for the internships, um, the interns weren't always, didn't always have those scholarly pursuits. And so we wanted to give the interns some of that flexibility so that we could actually um, focus and help drive the intern based on what their own professional goals were. So if those goals were scholarly, then we would, of course, um, recruit someone to work with them, depending on, you know, with the interns, um, of course, full uh, participation about who that might be to help mentor them. But to also for us, we realized that, you know, some interns are completely collections focused and we wanted to give them that opportunity to experience collections outside of what we could provide at SAR um, as well. And so it just allowed us a little more flexibility, but I agree that, you know, that there still continues to need to be a lot more work in terms of being able to um, combine our, uh, you know, the scholarly pursuits that SAR is known for um, with the native arts pursuits, which SAR is also known for, but somehow exists in these kinds of silos that um, I know that myself and um, there are director of scholar programs, Paul Ryer, we've been trying to grapple with that as well. So it's something, it's, it's in the shoot. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just add that, um, you know, what I was really grateful to observe during my term there was um, kind of this 
let's say, let's call it a shift in, in the ways in which IARC um, was receiving attention from the leadership of SAR, uh, from the board level, um, Michael Brown, the president, and um, you know, the various directors there at IARC. I, I really appreciated the uh, interest um, to work with IARC and to join us in thinking about the future of IARC even at that time. And um, you know the potential expansion of, of facilities to um, you know address the long-term stewardship of the collection, uh, the potential for bringing in additional materials. Um, and providing, uh, again, access to community members uh, 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 to those collections. Um, and expanding you know, the programming. Uh, you all are an incredible staff, but you also uh, you know, uh, are limited in terms of the number uh, of, of, of you. You're, there's just a, a few of you there. And um, I think that there's a potential to grow a little bit where, where, where that's concerned, building the capacity um, and really setting the stage for maybe some of the community-based research, um, the, these ideas that have evolved as a result of the collections reviews and as a result of uh, tribal visits to the collections uh, and really giving the opportunity for our own tribal communities to engage in research that is uh, meaningful and important to them. Um, I also think that, you know, there's some conversations around conservation of the collection uh, that um, need to continue and maybe, um, you know, be uh, taken up a notch in terms of really then some actions, um, uh, you know, yeah, taking from the collections reviews and recommendations, perhaps, or proposals that have been developed since, and, uh, you know, developing the the process for engaging in that active collaborative conservation uh, of the collection. And I think that there's an opportunity for SAR um, as an institution and certainly the IRC to have a role in supporting our tribal communities uh, across the country in some of the movements um, that are uh, very active around um, you know, uh, these new concepts of rematriation, of, um, uh, you know, equity and um, protection of sacred sites and cultural resources and just the natural or natural environment, uh, revitalization of our languages. You know, there's so much happening at the tribal level. And I think that, you know, SAR, there's a lot of scholarship that has, um, and research that have been conducted by SAR scholars and others and I think there's a, it's time to maybe, you know, uh, give back uh, a little more to our communities and, and help them along if, 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 if they can um, uh, on some of these efforts. Uh, and certainly, you know, coming out of COVID um, where we are still healing and I think just starting the recovery process. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of support that needs to be provided to our tribal communities, the artists, the scholars. Cynthia talked about jobs earlier. You know, um, we have to be thinking about all of these things and finding a way to be a part of, you know, um, empowering our, our tribal communities and um, all people, you know, who care about these things so and about our futures. Thank you. I would say that, um, you know, as you think about growth, you also have to think about how will that change the really unique special environment that's been nurtured over these many years at IARC and SAR. Um, I would recommend never become an exhibiting institution <laughs> and become, you know, and also not to become too public because that does take away time from you know these these very concentrated um, um, projects that are focused on the collections and communities and with artists, uh, you know that's one thing that I, I I do really miss is you know having that time where staff can really just focus 
on a project that involves community, involves collections, and you know, versus having to worry about, oh, when when is the next exhibit gonna have to go up? That kind of thing. So um, yeah, there's there's um there, there, there's a, a SAR, IRC are very, it's a, there, it's a very special place. And I think it's trying to retain that special nature of it as you embark upon this, this period of planned growth. So I know you're still talking about the expansion, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More to come. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's given me and all of us kind of a lot to think about in terms of how we approach the future. And yes, I agree, Brian. I think one of the things that we really want to look more at is how do we give back more um, to the communities that have given so much to make the Indian Arts Research Center what it is today. Um, I'd like to open um, the discussion up now to the Q&A, and um, we're going to start kind of looking at the questions in the, uh, in the Q&A section. So if you have questions, go ahead and drop it uh, into the Q&A button. Um, but I'd like to start with Susan Howard's question, which um, is kind of related to what we've been talking about, and some of it has already kind of been answered here. But Susan asks, in each of your opinion, where would you like to see the IRC moving in the future? What would make the bigger, biggest difference to its scope and reach? So I guess I'll start a little bit. Um, one of the things I would really like to see more is um, you know, Brian, you talked a little bit about how IRC in the past has really been perceived as being just kind of up on this hill behind these um, big adobe walls, which is like literally true. That is a physical description of our space, but it's also like a mental um, description of our face, place, of our space of, as being kind of just kind of inaccessible. And as we move into growth and move into this, these possibilities of expansion, I would really like to see communities be able to kind of claim the space as their own, as being comfortable just being here and being with the collections. Um, and that we are a resource um, for, for communities um, to use. Um, and it's something we've been moving toward for quite a while, but you know, there's still so much work to be to be done on this. Um, I'd also like for us, you know, SAR as a whole has a, you know, a global reach, a global mission. I'd like for us to see these issues of museum equity be involved, not just with native collections, but in other, but in other areas um, of, you know, communities are represented within museums so that there is this greater breaking down of relationships between museums and communities as a whole. And those are kind of two things that um, I would like to see happen in the future, I guess, at some point. Um, Cynthia, Brian. Well, I, I think we shared, you know, some of our, our vision earlier. Um, and I would just, you know, reiterate this idea that, you know, we embarked on while I was there to, to think about the expansion and uh, in, a, in a very responsible and thoughtful way um, so that it's relevant to the institution and the history of the institution, but also supports the um, community-based uh, initiatives of, of the IRC and the IRC community, which is quite ex, uh, ex expanded now. So um, I think that, you know, there's a, there should be a strategy in place for uh, attaining some of these goals over, you know, a period of time. And of course, all of this takes money. And, um, you know, that's always a challenge. Uh, but I think that the success of the IRC and its programming and its outreach and in the scholarship, um, you know, certainly uh, provide for uh, the opportunity to harness the resources that are necessary to endow some of 
you know, really uh, establish an endowment to support some of these initiatives. Thank you, Brian. The next question I'd like uh, to share is from Kate Calmies. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's not really a question, it's just a comment, but she says, the SAR guidelines for collaboration have been instrumental in my work. Thank you. So thank you both for really bringing up um, and to Landis too, who I know is in the audience somewhere for really uh, making the guidelines possible. Elaine Webster, um, sorry, I keep forgetting to hit the button. Um, regarding collaboration, she says, I live in Las Cruces and we're just far enough away that travel to the Northern part of the state requires time and money. Would you consider collaborating with our museums to set up local exhibits and maybe traveling shows? So um, yeah, so SAR is a non-exhibiting institution. So we don't typically produce exhibits. Um, we do, um, we are in the process of producing an exhibit for our 100th anniversary called Grounded in Clay, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery with 60 uh, community curators, including Brian here. Um, but that is um, not something we typically do. And unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity for it. That said, um, you know, there are, you know, communities that are further south than northern New Mexico, there are kind of unrecognized Pueblo communities, um, such as like the Piro and the, you know, Manso peoples who live down near Las Cruces. Um, and I'm happy to put you in touch with those folks um, that I think would be so excited to be able to tell their own stories. Um, accessing the guidelines for collaboration, which um, I think Paloma put in the chat earlier, and maybe she can type it back in the chat one more time, um, is also another way to kind of help with the process of collaboration. And I will say, although it's not ideal, um, one of the things as we were developing Grounded in Clay, um, the huge majority of it had to be done um, on Zoom because we were in a pandemic. Uh, so it, it is possible without travel, it's not ideal, but I think it's also really important to emphasize to um, the higher ups, to administration, how important that process of collaboration is um, so that funds can be directed or redirected toward that process. And that becomes kind of one of the key goals for an institution. So it does require some structural change. Um, Cynthia, Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Any other pieces of advice? <laughs> okay. I, I would uh, I would just add that you know, um, Stephanie's part of the staff, right? Mm -hmm. Stephanie Riley from Acoma, who um, is a, a alum of uh, New Mexico State University, and she worked at the museum there, and she might have some ideas um, so I would maybe put her connect her with the, the individual who asked the question. Yes so um, I will uh, Paloma can you type um, or let me, let me see if I can do this. I will our um, IARC email is IARC at SARSF as an SAR Santa Fe dot org. Um, you can shoot us an email and we'll try to put you in touch with um, those folks. So next question. Thank you, Paloma. <laughs> um, Barbara Wittemeyer asks, uh, Gwatsi Hopa from Barbara Wittemeyer, could you talk a bit about how non-natives who may only experience non-specific museums and might have distorted views about the native displays how they should approach visiting IARC and NMAI. And she says, thank you for doing this. Lovely to see you all. So I think, of, well, for, um, for um, NMAI, one of the interesting things about I was there in the early 2000s and then um, 
went to left there in 2005 to go to IPCC, then to ISAR, IARC, and then went back to NMAI in 2014. So the NMAI of the early 2000s is a different NMAI from the one that I encountered in 2014. So early 2000s, the exhibits that um, were developed were very much developed in collaboration with indigenous people. One of the things that we probably didn't do as much of is really consider our audience and you know what, how they might um, um, approach or understand um, the content that was being presented those, those, through those exhibits. I also think it was a very different time and, and, and you know the, the, the imbalances in terms of um, who has authority to represent who <laughs> was very much more on the museum side than the indigenous people side. So you know different time. So coming in to, back to NMAI 2014, our exhibits are very much more now focused on the audience and the audience expectations and the audience's understanding. You know, one of the things that I heard strongly when I got back to NMAI was we want to meet audiences where they are. So today, I guess, you know, considering Barbara's question, I don't think there's so much of a concern that what you know, the exhibits that um, visitors are seeing at NMAI are inaccessible to them or, you know, that there needs to be another level of interpretation, you know, in, in their viewing of those exhibits. Um, that, that said, I think we still are missing something in terms of, you know, the, the indigenous, um, the, the indigenous um, consultation or collaboration piece is, is, is not as strong as it was in the early 2000s. So that's you know, what, as director, I'm looking to bring back to NMAI. And I think that um, you know, that is a process. It's easy to say, um, but as we know in creating the guidelines for collaboration, we created those for a reason because there is this hesitancy, there is this fear when you haven't done that kind of work to jump into it, right? So I think at NMAI, the, 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 the goal is to, to begin to work with the staff to provide that guidance and that understanding about how to do this work. You know, what are the methodologies for doing this work and what are our goals in doing this work? Keeping in mind that yes, we do have an audience that have, a certain, have certain levels of understanding, um, um, but I think that those, those two things can exist together. Um, we just haven't tried that yet. <laughs> yet. That's always so important. Um, I think the only thing I would add about that in terms of how to approach visiting IRC and NMAI and versus kind of like, these kind of non-specific museums. I think something that's really important, sometimes something that we always try to get across is that there's a lot of specificity and that, you know, Native America, Indian country is very complex and that there are so many different um, aspects to it and that no one community is the same as another, just as, you know, You know, China is not the same as, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Korea or something like that, just as, you know, New York is not the same as California. Um, and I think if, as an interpreter, if you can get people to understand that, um, the rest of it comes a little bit easier. So that's all I have to. I don't know, Brian, did you want to address anything or? I think just, just one point about the IRC tour is, um, you know, Alicia has worked uh, in her previous role, worked very hard to develop a very comprehensive um, training program for docents. And um, I think that what, even that docent training program is unique 
uh, and is a good model for um, uh, for other for other institutions. Um, what I uh, hope to see at IARC is that we have um, and find a way to engage uh, our Pueblo people in that program in, into an interpreta interpretation uh, initiative. Um, because I think that, you know, it certainly uh, makes a, a huge difference when you're hearing the history of, of the, 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 the collection uh, from, from a, a Pueblo perspective or even just Pueblo voice. So that's the only thing, other thing that I would add. Otherwise, I think that you know the, the docents, um, and there are many who have gone through that training, do an exceptional job in, in providing the, the, the history and talking about the program that exists there, the SAR, and, and how that col the collection is utilized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. So the next thing I want to share is a comment from Prudy Correa. Hello, Prudy. Um, she says, I absolutely agree with Brian and Cynthia. As an artist and now elder, it is such a blessing to visit, share our knowledge and experiences with our pottery and textiles as a group visit where we talk in our language and also learn from each other. She says, thank you. Thank you, Prudy. Um, Connie Jackwith asks, how do you envision IRC playing a role in helping non-Native academics in their professional development and understanding of Native issues and culture? I think, you know, we've been thinking about that for a while, and I think the development of the guidelines for collaboration was the first step in kind of not only helping communities to better understand um, how to enter in the very into the very murky kind of area of museum and museum work, but also how to assist museums to work better with communities. And um, I mentioned earlier that we're now developing um, a new set of guidelines, um, the core standards for museums with Native American collections, which covers a much broader um, area of museum work. And those will, um, we are working with the American Alliance of Museums on those guidelines um, to hopefully present it at a national level. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we are um, hoping to work with academics and other um, museum professionals to kind of better understand um, Native uh, issues and cultures. Um, we can't say specifically for which native issues and cultures because of course, again, that there's a high degree of specificity and it depends who and when you are talking about. Um, but um, I can say for the field of museology um, that right now is uh, our plan. Thank you, Connie. So Rob Lucas asks, um, is it possible to provide some specific examples for how na native language can influence or enhance the understanding of an object in the collection? Brian or Cynthia, do either of you want to take that? Um, thanks for the question, Rob. Um, you know, the collections reviews, um, at least what I experienced with ACMA was um, provided much more information maybe than what we even anticipated because of the use of the Akama language in that review. Um, it provided a, a much better understanding of the items uh, for, for, for purposes of documentation of the collection at IRC. But I would say more importantly was that it provided um, 
information for the Pueblo members themselves. It reminded them of the importance of addressing pottery or a textile um, or anything else made, any other material culture from Acma in the native language because it, I think is the way they would have said in Acma that it gives life to the item um, when you address it in your own language, that it isn't just a pottery, but juni or spuna, uh, those different classifications of pottery. And then from just that one word, that of the keras word for that item, there's then this explanation of its use and its importance. Um, so it just expands the uh, the definition beyond the identification of, a, of an item as a pot or as a bowl, as a canteen or a medicine bowl or whatever. You know, it, it gives a far greater meaning beyond just, you know, the dis describing what it, what it is. And then of course you get into the design and there's a whole another terminology that then evolves uh, around design and pigment paints and application of paint. Uh, process for applying uh, and determining application of a certain design on a on a certain form. So it just it was almost never ending, and that's I guess that's why those those reviews take years. You know, it's just going into those details and allowing the reviewers themselves in their own language to have that critical um, assessment of of each piece. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, that's a perfect example because when I, we were doing the Zuni reviews, a lot of the water jars were identified as Hoyas, <laughs> you know, that's Spanish. Um, and I guess it means jar. Um, so, you know, um, just like you said, Brian, um, Jim and Octavius were very clear on using the Zuni word for water like this is something that carries water. Yeah, and it's, you know, something that gets entered into our database, um, that Zuni word for water. I, I'm not going to say it out loud right now because I know I'm going to mess it up, but um, it's something that is in our database and something that we use and it gets applied into our labels and, and whatnot. Um, but I also want to clarify that sometimes these discussions about naming and things like that remains with the community and the community decides to not have that entered into our database. And we always um, uh, honor those requests. And so sometimes those uh, names remain in English and sometimes they're changed, it changed. It just kind of depends on, um, on each uh, community when we're working with them, what their uh, preferences and choices are for those names. But yeah, um, I think that's the incredible thing about working with the collections is, that it can really um, provide a space for using and better understanding uh, language. So um, we are at uh, the 3.30 mark now, and um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer all of the questions, but I think we got through uh, quite a few of them. Um, I just wanted to thank Brian and Cynthia again for joining us today on this discussion about the Indian Arts Research Center, the past, present, um, and future, and for everything that they've done for the field of museums and for SAR um, over the last two decades. Um, Tomorrow, um, April 7th, we, we have another event coming up. We have an SAR Artist Live program with um, Nora Naranjo Marsh and um, Elysia Escobedo um, at 6 p.m. on our Instagram channel. So join us for that um, if you'd like to. It's a very casual, um, homey conversation where you can chat and just be with amazing artists for about a half hour during an evening. Um, the second installment of this year's speaker series, um, which is consider, Considerations for Indigenous Collections Care, 
will be held next Wednesday on April 13th at 2 p.m. So if you want to kind of continue this discussion, learn more what is being done for uh, the care of Indigenous collections, I encourage you to join us for that conversation. You can just go to our website and sign up for the webinar just like you did. Uh, for this one. Um, there are so many amazing comments in here. I want to thank you all for attending and being a part of our history today and being a part of what we hope will be a really remarkable future over the next hundred years. So thank you all and um, we'll say goodbye. Thank you, Alicia. Good to see you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Okay.